Welcome everyone to MTRI's June CIFAC seminar. My name is Chad Simmons and I'm an ecologist here at the Mercy Tobiatic Research Institute. And you'll probably notice tonight that I'm not, I don't have my uh, video on. That's because I'm streaming live from Shelburne County. I am at the Islands Provincial Park in the middle of uh, some field work. So uh, trying to conserve that precious uh, bandwidth. Um, but before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that MTRI is in and we are meeting from Gespoik, uh, Southwest Nova Scotia, one of the seven districts of Mi'kma'ki, homeland of the Mi'kmaq people. We acknowledge the treaties of peace and friendship and we wanna thank the Mi'kmaq people for their generosity in sharing their homeland with us. So for anyone who is new to MTRI, we are a research-based nonprofit and we are nestled in the heart of Southwest Nova Scotia, just down the road from Kejimakujik National Park and National Historic Site, and within the Southwest Nova Scotia Biosphere Reserve. Our mission is to promote, conserve, and sustain biodiversity, biodiversity in Guestbook as well as beyond. So tonight, I would like to welcome Emily Young. Emily is a Master of Science candidate at Dalhousie University, and tonight she'll be sharing some of her research. So next, I'm going to hand it over to Emily, but I'd like to remind everyone to please keep your mics muted. And if you have any questions during the talk, you can type them into the chat window and we'll read them at the question period, or you can ask Emily um, yourself uh, during the question period at the end. So with that, Emily, it's all yours. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction, Chad, and thank you for having me. So hi, everybody. Uh, as Chad introduced, I'm Emily, and today I'm going to be going over my uh, thesis research um, and basically the relationship between salinity and the Atlantic whitefish and how it's the really great case study for the use of conservation physiology for um, the conservation of uh, freshwater and marine fish. So let's start with what makes a whitefish. Unfortunately, not a lot of native Nova Scotians and certainly not a lot of Canadians know about this little guy. The Atlantic whitefish is a fish endemic to Nova Scotia, meaning it's found nowhere else in the world. Currently, the only remaining wild population is limited to three lakes in Petite Riviere watershed in Lunenburg County, Heb Lake, Malipsigit Lake, and Manamkeek Lake. These lakes total about 16 kilometers squared worth of surface area and empty into the Atlantic Ocean just south of the town of Bridgewater. Current if you'd expect that because of this limited habitat that the population is quite small, then you would be correct. However, the Atlantic whitefish do take this to a bit of an extreme. Adults are rarely ever seen in the wild and genetic estimates of long-term effective population size put it between 18 and 91 breeding adults. Unfortunately, their rarity in the wild means we have a relatively poor understanding of their threats and factors that have made and keep their population so repressed. Unsurprisingly, they are also listed as endangered by COSIWIC, the governing body for the status of endangered species in Canada. And as such, it's been listed as a, um, on the Species at Risk Act or SARA since 2006. While the cause of initial decline for the species is still unclear, best guesses place, seem to point to a combination of over harvesting and extensive dam building throughout southern Nova Scotia, and potentially the introduction of aquatic invasive species that are known to eat other fish. Pictured here is Heb Dam immediately downstream from Heb Lake, one of the three lakes that the Atlantic whitefish currently live in, and also one of the collection sites where we try to collect yearly larvae um, from the wild to bring into the captive breeding program that we have at Dalhousie University. So current threats are likely a combination of a number of these things as well. For one, their small population size makes them increasingly vulnerable to general threats to fish population. The smaller your population is, the more likely you are statistically just to be wiped out by a random event, something we call environmental stochasticity or unpredictable environmental variation. Specifically to the whitefish, however, invasive fishes such as smallmouth bass and chain pickerel, both of which who are our voracious predators of smaller fish also pose a significant threat to what is likely a very small population. So there are a few general reasons about why it's important we put effort into preserving this species. 
for one, despite being relatively unknown, the Atlantic whitefish is and should be recognized as an iconic species in Nova Scotia and Canada as a whole. Canada has only four endemic water freshwater fish, fish that are found nowhere else outside of Canada, of which the Atlantic whitefish is one. And it's also the only species of vertebrate that's endemic to Nova Scotia. To go further, the species also represents a remarkable evolutionary history. Pictured here is the family Salmonidae, which includes various species of salmon, trout, grayling, and whitefish. If I zoom in here on the Corrigonus genus, the white, you can see various species of true whitefish and cisco. But I'll call your attention to the Atlantic whitefish here at the very bottom, Corrigonus huntsmani. And if we follow the branch of the tree from the species to where it meets with the rest, it brings us to what is actually the very beginning of divergence in the Corrigonus genus. So the Atlantic whitefish represent the only lineage of whitefish within the genus that is unique to North America and not found elsewhere outside of the US and Canada. And perhaps most remarkably, they diverge from the remainder of the genus at this node about 15 million years ago. So seeing one in the wild is actually the evolutionary equivalent of walking into a field and spotting a saber-toothed cat. Again, more generally, as many of you know, patterns of global diversity reach a peak around the equator and taper off towards either pole. So Canada and other northern nations have a lower biodiversity and fewer endemic species compared to equatorial regions. In a time of unprecedented biodiversity loss globally, regions of low biodiversity are particularly vulnerable to climate change and instabilities within the ecosystem. So because of these often unique circumstances that under which endemic species occur, putting focus on the preservation of these species often leads naturally into also protecting areas where biodiversity is particularly low and the, or necess not necessarily low, but particularly vulnerable. Again, more generally, the preservation of the Atlantic whitefish would also mean a lot in, as a case study in fish conservation. Because of the nature of aquatic habitats, conservation of marine and freshwater organisms is already quite difficult because you have a three-dimensional sampling space as opposed to a two-dimensional. And working with aquatic organisms in a laboratory does pose different complications that don't necessarily come with air-breathing animals. So, in addition, compared to marine fish, work on anadromous and freshwater fish is also grossly underrepresented, but equally as important to Canada's biodiversity and other animals and factors within those ecosystems that they share. And then finally, there's the argument to be made about the inherent value of the species. While there will always be those who will ask, what is the point, uh, particularly when it comes to a species like this that doesn't necessarily present an economic value to us as humans. Uh, and in, in addition, may perhaps not uh, keystone species in their ecosystems, will the Petit Riviere be absolutely devastated if we lose them altogether? In all honesty, probably not, but I don't think it's necessarily a controversial thing to say that it's better to preserve the species than to lose it, especially when there's so much we don't know about them that it very well could be more important than we currently assume. Well, we've now established that they should be saved. So where do we start? Uh, perhaps we can start with what we know, which frankly, isn't that much. Despite having a very long evolutionary history, the species wasn't actually described in any kind of detail until between the 1960s and the 1980s. So not much is understood about their life cycle and reproductive habits, and most of what we know are educated speculations based on related species, captive fish, and from another population that existed at this time, but has since been extirpated in the Tuscannes River watershed in Yarmouth County. The most relevant bit of information today that we know from this extirpated population is that the species is likely naturally anadromous, 
So like our Atlantic salmon, they journey to the, from the sea into fresh water to spawn and then back out to sea for the remainder of the year as breeding adults. The Tuscate River population was observed making these seasonal migrations in and out of these river mouths. But if you recall, the only remaining population of Atlantic whitefish live in lakes where they actually have been effectively isolated from the ocean for the better part of a hundred years by a series of five dams. You can see here at these black bars on the map. There have been sporadic reports of whitefish in river mouths around the Petit Rivière, but there've been no reports of any major upstream or downstream migrations in the watershed since it was, since the species started to be monitored more closely in the late 1900s. So with so many questions to answer and so much information missing from the puzzle, it's important not to lose sight about what the top priority is, is to preserve the species, or at the very least stabilize the population long enough to buy ourselves some time to answer some of these secondary questions. So with that, I'd like to go over the current recovery strategy outlined by the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, and it has three main objectives. A, to achieve population stability, B, to expand their range beyond the Petit Riviere, and C, to reestablish the anadromous form of these fish. So let's look at anadromy a little bit more closely. You'll recall the Atlantic whitefish is a member of the Salmonidae family, and you may be familiar with the fact that many other Salmonids are also anadromous. And within species or even a population, some fish will go to sea and others might remain as freshwater residents. For example, these cutthroat trout on the slide. And you may also notice that the difference in this kind of life history trajectory that they take may also result in differences in how the fish looks or behaves in their, um, so their morphology in general. But why would a fish go to sea to begin with? At higher latitudes away from the equator, you get a higher frequency of salmonid populations that are anadromous rather than being strictly freshwater. So in general, at these higher or extreme low latitudes towards the poles, it, the marine habitat is more productive than freshwater habitats. So there's more food. So in a lot of cases, these anadromous fish show substantial increases in their daily growth rate compared to their freshwater counterparts, resulting in a larger body size at a younger age. So this itself influences a lot of other important attributes of a fish's life. Larger fish can have more offspring, can have larger eggs. They have a competitive advantage over their peers, reduced vulnerability to predators and resulting in potentially a longer lifespan. The ocean may also provide a thermal refuge from rising temperatures in the future for whitefish and other salmonids, given that they are mostly cold water fish. And more specifically to the whitefish, as I mentioned, they're invasive predators. They might provide some relief from this pressure of these freshwater invasives, particularly if the juvenile whitefish start their seaward migration before chain pickerel and smallmouth bass, which are warm water fish, become highly active in the summer months. However, if all of that is true, then why don't all fish with access to the ocean make the trip? So let's think about what this means on the scale of an individual fish. When a fish crosses uh, freshwater into saltwater or saltwater into freshwater, it requires a reworking of their osmotic physiology. Fish aren't like us, meaning that they are more permeable to their surrounding environment than we are. So most fish, while they maintain an internal ion concentration of between 10 and 12 uh, parts per trillion, their surrounding environment is constantly in flux with the ions in their body. So in freshwater, where the surrounding environment has a lower ion concentration, to maintain homeostasis, fish constantly have to be bringing in ions through their diet and excreting excess water. In salt water, it's the opposite, where they constantly have to be drinking this salt water and excreting excess ions. So going between habitats of different salinities also introduces this additional complication where the fish needs to alter their physiology to be able to go from excreting excess ions and taking in water to taking to ink, excuse me, to intaking ions and excreting excess water. Theoretically, these processes would take up energy that's 
otherwise would be available to other aspects of an individual's life. So we have the benefits of anadromy that I went over on the previous slide, but there are also costs, these osmoregulatory costs, as well as potential costs of novel predators that they didn't encounter in their freshwater habitats, and the exercise that's required to partake in a migration. Theoretically, if the benefits of a migration outweigh the costs, then taking on a seaward migration is beneficial to the species or a population or an individual, and you would expect to see it happen at a higher frequency. So let's come back to our whitefish. The problem in this case is that at the most basic level, we don't actually understand whether restoring the anadromous form is even feasible. Previous work on a number of species has revealed that in some cases, when selection for pressure for a saltwater tolerance is relaxed, landlocked populations of previously anadromous species can become less tolerant of saltwater. So the only remaining population of Atlantic whitefish have been isolated from the ocean for 30 to 40 generations. While likely not a long time on an evolutionary time scale, this is certainly enough time for changes in the frequency of traits held by a population to occur, particularly since they've been declining for an unknown period of time. So the general question is, how do they actually handle seawater? Luckily, what recent work has been done on the Atlantic whitefish has revealed that they can still fully tolerate seawater, even at the most sensitive larval stages. And even in the case of juveniles, they seem to prefer it. The first stages of my own work uh, with the acclimation of the fish that I've been doing also confirm this. However, tolerance does not necessarily equate to suitability. The fact that they tolerate salt water very well does not mean that under different, perhaps more stressful situations, the Atlantic whitefish would fail to thrive in salt water, especially when you consider what else a fish might encounter during a migration, novel environments, physically challenging habitats with high flow, new predators, and a host of other factors. So let's talk about what conservation physiology is first. Dr. Stephen Cook at Carleton defines it as an integrative scientific discipline applying physiological concepts, tools, and knowledge to characterizing biological diversity and its ecological implications, understanding and predicting how organisms, populations, and ecosystems respond to environmental change and stressors, and solving conservation problems across a broad range of taxa. More specifically, um, is a discipline applying all aspects of physiology to understanding conservation issues. And here we mean physiology to mean the functional and mechanistic response of a living organism to its environment. How, just, how is its body working? What is it doing? So I'm going to take this and apply conservation physiology principles to the questions that we want to answer and should be immediately answering about the whitefish. Namely, does maintaining homeostasis in salty or brackish water leave less room in the energy budget than freshwater where they currently are residing in the wild? And two, do salinities produce differences in the stress response to exhaustive exercise? And I'll be doing this by examining uh, blood parameters, sorry, the cat's gonna move. So by examining blood parameters, aerobic scope, and critical swimming speed of the Atlantic whitefish acclimated to different salinities. The 90 fish I'll be using are a subset of fish born last year to the Dalhousie Aquachon Whitefish Breeding Program. This is the first generation cohort as their parents were caught as larvae um, in the wild at 2018 to 2019. Heb Dam that I showed previously would be one of those collection sites. So the juvenile fish I have have been divided into three treatment groups and have been acclimating to uh, freshwater, saltwater and brackish water um, since the beginning of December or zero PPT, 15 parts per trillion, and 30 parts per trillion. Blood, um, as some background for blood sampling, is a diverse medium that contains loads of information from all over the body in ways of cells, ions, gases, and biomolecules like RNA. In my study, I'll be examining parameters relevant to stress and ion regulatory capacity, such as glucose, lactate, and the balance of ions, namely sodium, potassium, and chlorine ions. It can also be sampled in a way that's minimally disturbed 
disturbing to the animals, such as you can see on this photo here, where you have a sedated fish that's flipped upside down and a syringe is inserted to the caudal vasculature, which lies just below the spine. And you can draw a good blood sample there without being particularly invasive to the fish. During my experiments, blood will be sampled from half of the fish to serve as a baseline. And then again, from the other half, which will be doing respirometry work for a post-exercise blood sample. So in my experiments, I'm going to be used what's called intermittent flow respirometry to measure routine or resting metabolic rate and maximum metabolic rate. Resting or routine metabolic rate, RMR, is vaguely defined for the sake of this experiment. That's going to be when the fish is in a fasted state, more or less at rest. So kind of a general measure for what we might have an idea for uh, maintenance levels of metabolism to be what's required just for being a fish, not necessarily hard work. Then maximum metabolic rate is fairly self-explanatory. It's the maximum aerobic metabolic rate a fish can sustain before they can't work any harder without going into anaerobic metabolism. So metabolism that doesn't require oxygen consumption. We measure MMR and RMR by proxy by measuring the uptake of oxygen uh, that a fish is going through over a given time. So the difference between the two is then used to calculate aerobic scope or the capacity to increase aerobic metabolic rate above those maintenance levels. At this time, I'll also be measuring their critical swimming speed or the fastest speed that they can maintain. And I'll explain this on the next slide. All of this information acts for as a proxy for understanding how is exposure to salt water um, affecting the energy budget of Atlantic whitefish. So in theory, if being in saltwater requires more energy, the aerobic scope presented by the saltwater fish should be a little bit smaller than those of the freshwater and brackish treatments. So during intermittent flow respirometry, a fish will be placed in this chamber, turn my laser pointer here, in this little swim tunnel, and water is pumped around this flume like a track by a motor here that's connected to a fan at varying speeds. So my experiments will look a little bit like this. You have a highlighted in blue arrest period here for the fish to acclimate to the respirometer and relax and calm down. And we'll start taking resting metabolic rate measurements right here, right where we have kind of a nice calm fish and he hasn't done any exercise, has kind of gotten over any initial panic from being put into the respirometer. And then we'll start stepping up the speed. And at each interval, the swim tunnel will then be sealed because it sits in a water bath that can, lets more fresh water flow into it. It will be sealed and we'll measure the depletion of oxygen over a known time interval. We'll then take a break, flush the flume, flume with fresh water to raise the oxygen again before stepping up to the next speed. And we'll continue to do this until the fish reach this kind of black dot here, which is what we would call our failure point, and also the critical swimming speed, when the fish can no longer maintain a fast, the speed that the water is going in, can't hold position in the respirometer anymore, and it will fall back against a grating at the back of the swim tunnel. At this point, we'll shut down the flume, open it up, let the fish breathe for a second, and then we'll take it out, sedate it, and take a post-exercise blood sample before putting it in a recovery tank to monitor it for the next few hours. So here I just have a little video of one of the fish I ran on Tuesday, and this guy just finished his maximum metabolic rate session. So you can still see he's got a little bit of a kick to him. It doesn't entirely... Um, knock them out for a while, but he is pretty tired and breathing pretty heavily. Oh, that accidentally played it. Okay. So then this data, the blood parameters and the respirometry data will be used to explore any differences that might appear between these treatment groups, different salinities in swimming performance, aerobic capacity, and osmoregulatory abilities. All in all, we're concerned with how well Atlantic whitefish will be performing in saline environments um, with applications to their conservation, uh, direct applications, in fact, 
that there is a team out there looking for potential places to put them beyond the Petite Riviere. But what's the point of limiting ourselves to lakes that are connected to the ocean if they happen to do better in fresh water or vice versa? If we find that fish acclimated to salt water have a comparable aerobic scope to fresh water, then we might conclude that Atlantic whitefish in the Petite Riviere, even over 100 years, haven't lost their anadromous capabilities. So this work has theoretical applications in that we're filling in what is currently a very large knowledge gap in the literature about this species with reference relevance to their life history strategies, natural state, physiology, um, but also it has direct applications to their conservation, specifically the recovery strategy objectives and the, the wise distribution of limited management resources. So with that, I am ready to take some questions. Thank you for being patient and listening to my, my little spiel about my fish. Great. Thank you so much, Emily. Very well done. And I just have to say amazing presentation. Top notch. <laughs> Thank you. So does anyone have any questions? I see that Ron did in the chat, but you uh, you answered his question already. Uh, so I'm just curious, Emily, is this sounds like it's pretty groundbreaking research. Is there any precedent um, to your results? Um, there, with regards to other salmonids, there's quite a lot of work that's been done on their physiology, particularly with Atlantic um, salmon, given that they're such an economically and culturally important fish to the east coast of Canada. However, it's very difficult to draw conclusions from other salmonids uh, to the Atlantic whitefish and just other salmonids in general, because they are a very diverse and plastic group of fish, meaning that they're just because something is one way with one species or even one individual within a species does not necessarily mean it will be the same way for other fish. So while there's a lot of work on landlocked um, sal salmon populations and the work behind them. The work that I'm doing here with the Atlantic whitefish is really the first of its kind for the species that's directly applicable to their conservation because there hasn't been a lot done on them. Be the there Since they were described as a species, we had a period of a high kind of conservation effort and breeding for the sake of conservation but under the harper government that kind of ended up being pulled back a little bit and then only since they've started rebreeding them at dalhousie and they've been you know becoming a larger priority for the department of fisheries and oceans have we really started to kind of kick up work on them in the last 10 years or so it's excellent to see the effort put into this saving the species well done I just have to thank you and uh, I'm sure your uh, your lab supervisor as well. Very good yes, work. Yes, that would be uh, Dr. Paul Benson. I'll give him a bit of a shout out. Uh, so I'm not seeing any more questions on our oh, Facebook. Oh, I just see one here from Ron. Oh, yes. Uh, so he says, Emily, you said- Oh, yes, I did say parts per trillion. That is correct. It's parts per thousand, my bad. Perfect. Ron is correct. I did say parts per trillion, but I meant 30 parts per thousand, which is what mimics the ocean and brackish and freshwater salinities. Okay, I'm not seeing any more questions. Uh, I'm just hearing congratulations from the Facebook side of our seminar and <laughs> um, just a few people saying amazing, well done, excellent presentation. Uh, so if there's no more questions, no? Okay. okay, well, excellent job, Emily. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for having me. And I would just like to thank the Region of Queens for supporting us tonight and our seminar series. As always, you can stay up to date with our seminars by following us on Facebook. And if you'd like to watch tonight's seminar again, you can check out our Facebook Live videos or visit our YouTube channel. And starting next week, we'll be switching to our weekly seminar series, our summer seminars. Uh, it'll be the same time every Thursday from 7 to 8 p.m. And you can join us online as usual 
or visit us in person at our field station in Kent, just down the road from Kejimakujik. Uh, so with that, thank you once again, Emily. Excellent job. And we hope everyone stays well and we get to see you all again very soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye now.